In this rejuvenated Compass model, Jeep has at last bought us a credible, class-competitive mid-sized SUV. It's not quite as car-like as some of its rivals, but if you want to be ready for snow as well as sun and for forest tracks as well as tarmac, you might feel this contender to be a better bet. We all know what a real Jeep looks like, rough, tough and wilderness ready. You might though be less acquainted with the models this growing brand wants to sell to ordinary family SUV buyers. Cars like this one, the Compass, aimed directly at the buoyant mid-sized Qashqai segment. Jeep has tried for years to crack this class of crossover, starting off in 2007 with the first generation version of this car. It sold in very modest numbers alongside a similar model, the Patriot, until 2011 then was facelifted for a similarly unsuccessful sale stint that lasted until 2015. A fifth generation Cherokee model was then launched to represent the brand in the mid-sized part of the SUV sector, but it didn't have the light, agile feel and affordable pricing that Qashqai class folk wanted. So that car was moved a little upmarket to make room for Jeep to reintroduce the Compass model line with this car in late 2017. There'll be no second chances this time. This Compass simply has to be a vast improvement on its disappointing predecessors, competing as it does in one of the motor industry's fastest growing market segments, a sector that'll soon annually account for over 2 million sales Europe wide. And there's reason for hope here. Jeep has enjoyed considerable success with its smaller Renegade SUV launched in 2015, which sells to the kinds of customers who often wouldn't be averse to the possibility of something equally trendy but slightly larger. The Compass aims to deliver exactly that, using a stretched version of its smaller Stablemates platform and a lot of the fashion-led touches that customers in this class now insist upon. But it's more than just another trendy soft roader. This one, we're told, isn't just for the school run set. Yes, it's able to deliver the family hatchback style ease of use you'll want, but here that's apparently been combined with a bit more SUV capability, the kind of thing beyond most rivals. It's not a Jeep for the Serengeti, but thanks to a tough Chapman strut rear suspension system, an active drive four-wheel drive setup, and a select terrain drive control package, 4x4 variants certainly promise enough off-road ability to justify this model's brand badging. But then we've heard all this kind of thing before from Jeep. Will the end result be different this time? Let's find out. So does this rejuvenated Compass model signal a new direction for Jeep? Just as importantly, would loyal buyers want it to? The trend amongst mainstream makers today is to produce SUVs that drive like family hatchbacks. Jeep can't wholeheartedly follow that, not if it wants to retain any brand credibility anyway. If you buy one of this American Marks products, even one as lifestyle orientated as this, then at the wheel you'll want, at least to some extent, to feel like you're in a proper SUV. Hopefully though in this case, one with some of the rough edges smoothed away. By and large, that's pretty much what you get here. The clunky utilitarian feel of the previous generation Compass is in this case replaced by something much less crude. But if your benchmark is something like a Qashqai or an Attica, then you'll notice quite a few differences here. Some of these are positive things, particularly the steering that's solid and reassuring. Other aspects of Jeep motoring may not be quite as welcome. The long throw gear change is more ponderous, the engines on offer lack a little in terms of ultimate refinement, and you're obviously not going to get the cornering agility that a mere hatchback based crossover is going to give you. But then that kind of car doesn't need to form the basis for what Jeep calls trail rated design. 
the top Trailhawk variant of this compass qualifies for that kind of wilderness 4x4 status. And though the lesser versions that almost all Compass customers will choose are far less capable, they'll still seem eminently credible on the kind of light forest trail you'd possibly feel rather silly driving over in most segment rivals. The thing is though, your typical motoring and mine does of course hardly ever take place on light forest trails, which is why this time around the brand has given this model the much stiffer small wide architecture Fiat Chrysler Group platform that on the smaller Renegade model has proved that Jeep really can make a credible crossover product. I've just mentioned that cornering agility leaves a little to be desired, but it's only fair to also say that it's a huge improvement on the lurching demeanor that's characterized the previous Jeep mid-sized products I've tried. Because more than 65% of the chassis is now fashioned from high strength steel, the structure's more rigid, so the suspension setup can be more compliant for tarmac use, while still keeping body roll in check through the bends. The ride is actually really good at cruising speeds, though it's less adept at dealing with things like speed humps and urban tarmac tears. You're going to want to know about the engine, drivetrain and transmission package, which uh, broadly is shared with that smaller Renegade model. Essentially, there are three levels of Compass ownership. At the bottom end of the scale, there are the entry-level variants, which use either a 140 horsepower, 1.4-litre multi-air petrol engine, or a 120 horsepower, 1.6-litre multi-jet diesel, and which come only with front-wheel drive and manual transmission. At the opposite end of the lineup lie the pricey 170 horsepower variants, a tuned up version of that 1.4 litre multi air petrol engine or a 2 litre multi jet diesel. Derivatives offered only with four wheel drive and the brand's rather slow shifting nine speed auto gearbox. It's the models in between these two extremes though that will interest a significant proportion of potential Compass customers. The ones fitted with the engine, drivetrain and transmission combination that we're trying here. A 140 horsepower, two litre multi-jet diesel paired with a manual gearbox and the Jeep active drive four wheel drive system. It doesn't feel an especially rapid unit, but it is a pretty torquey one with 350 Newton meters of pulling power, enough to enable this variant to tow up to 1.9 tons. You'll do well to better that in this segment. Bear in mind that with the pricier 2 litre 170 auto diesel models, you will only be able to tow 1.5 tons, while the front driven petrol and diesel derivatives are limited to a ton. As for the performance statistics, well, the two manual diesel models aren't separated by much. This 140 horsepower, two liter multi-jet 4x4 version getting from rest to 62 miles an hour in 10.1 seconds en route to 118 miles an hour, which is only fractionally quicker than the base front driven 1.6 liter multi-jet 120 horsepower model. There, the figures are 11 seconds and 115 miles an hour. You won't go much faster in the top 2 litre multi-jet 170 horsepower 4x4 variant either. This auto derivative making 62 miles an hour in 9.5 seconds en route to 122 miles an hour. As for the two 1.4 litre multi-air petrol models, well the base 140 horsepower front driven version makes 62 miles an hour in 9.9 .9 seconds en route to 119 miles an hour and the top 1.4 litre multi-air 170 horsepower 4x4 auto variant marginally improves that to 9.5 seconds and 124 miles an hour. But of course you don't buy a Jeep in search of stopwatch performance. You buy it because it's a credible SUV. With that in mind, the brand expects that a large proportion of Compass customers will want a four-wheel drive model like the one I'm trying here. In this car's sales segment, some key crossover competitors, uh, models like Peugeot's 3008, Vauxhall's Grandland X and Honda's HRV, don't offer you the option of all-wheel traction at all. Many of the others seem to add in an off-the-shelf Holdex on-demand 4x4 system on pricey top models as something of an afterthought. Jeep, though, sees things differently, providing four-wheel drive compass variants with a tough Chapman strut rear suspension setup and a sophisticated active drive 4x4 system that uses the same so-called rear axle disconnect system you'll also find on a Range Rover Evoque. 
here it benefits from an increase in ride height up from the modest 198 millimeters of two-wheel drive models to 208 millimeters if you get this Jeep with four-wheel drive and crucially it's been paired to the brand's excellent select terrain system Select Terrain is a setup designed to replicate the feeling of having an off-road expert sitting next to you as you drive. With a twist of the rotary Select Terrain dial that four-wheel drive compass models offer in front of the gear stick, you can choose between a series of customised drive settings to suit the ground that you're travelling over. There are snow, sand or mud uh, modes if you've at least some idea of what you're doing but if you haven't then simply select the auto setting and leave the car to sort itself out there's also a lock mode that'll keep all the wheels turning at the same speed if you end up with your compass somewhere you really shouldn't have ventured to in the first place this kind of terrain can obviously be addressed more confidently if you've honed your off-road driving technique, something this car can help you to do with the Jeep Skills feature that can be downloaded onto the Uconnect center dash screen. This measures drive, pitch, roll, pressure and altitude to give you real-time feedback on your off-road driving abilities. You'll also get information on things like g-forces, steering angle and performance, uh, guidance to recommended routes and even online awards called badges to recognize improvements in your driving prowess. If all this sort of thing appeals, you've a healthy budget to work with and like the idea of occasionally venturing into the unknown, then you might be one of the few buyers likely to be attracted by the flagship Trailhawk variant. This derivative uses the top 2 litre 170 horsepower diesel engine and auto transmission package but mates it to a version of the active drive four wheel drive system that uses a low range gearbox. Jeep calls this its active drive low setup. Trailhawk buyers also get an even higher 216mm ride height, underbody skid plates and a built in hill descent control feature to ease you down slippery slopes. All of this, along with restyled bumpers, will allow you to attack really testing terrain. The approach, departure and breakover angles you'd get on the normal 4x4 version of this Jeep, uh, 16.8 degrees, 31.7 degrees and 22.9 degrees, are on a trail hop model improved dramatically to 30 degrees, 33.6 degrees and 24.4 degrees. Plus, Trailhawk buyers get an extra rock mode on the select terrain system, cementing this variant's top trail rated status. It's all very impressive, but ultimately somewhat irrelevant in terms of the more affordable, modestly powered compass models that the majority of customers will choose. And here lies the problem. It's very hard to take a car that's so potentially capable off-road and create from it a range of more tarmac orientated versions that can ride and handle as well as less rugged rivals on a paved surface. Now Jeep has certainly tried hard to achieve that, something aided by the underpinnings that this car shares with its FCA group cousin the Fiat 500X. To some extent, those efforts have borne fruit, but ultimately, you're never allowed to forget that this is more of a proper SUV. At the wheel of this car, there's no fake Qashqai genre pretense of ruggedness. Instead, you know that you're in a Jeep, not only because of the shape and the design, but because of the capable, solid feel that's delivered as you drive. Is that exactly as it should be? Plenty of loyal buyers will think so. Cars of this kind used to be called crossovers. Then we got told to call them SUVs. It's a designation that sits a touch incongruously with some other fickle fashion-led contenders in this class. But this Jeep does in every sense look like a proper modern compact SUV rather than the kind of hatchback on steroids that most of the magazine experts will tell you to buy in this segment. 
No, it doesn't have the extrovert demeanor of the company's smaller Renegade model. Jeep's aware that customers in this class are a touch more conservative, but there's still a splash of self-confident design here. Apparently a Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird stealth reconnaissance aircraft was one of the design inspirations. No, I can't see it either. Of course, reminders of brand heritage are never very far away. The most obvious reference in this regard lying with this traditional seven slot front grille, or at least what looks like a seven slot front grille. Actually, a touch disappointingly, it's a molded plastic panel with no cooling functionality whatsoever. That's taken care of further down. Still, the chrome and gloss black finishing looks nice and flows into smart LED headlamps with black bezels. A subtle silvered skid plate strip finishes things off below the lower air intake. Move to the side and once more you're confronted by a mix of tradition and trendiness. The squared off wheel arches reference every Jeep made since the Second World War. A flourish curiously juxtaposed with this swept back windscreen angle and the tapering rear roof line. Avoid entry level trim and you get this chromed strip separating the top of the window line from an upper profile silhouette that on request can be finished in a contrasting gloss black. A couple of mid-level creases attempt to give the flanks some shape and those black plastic clad arches house rims that according to trim vary between 16 and 19 inches in size. Uh, we've got 19 inches here. The rear end is more segment generic, but like the front, continues the purposeful SUV styling emphasis. Again, quite refreshingly, you're left in little doubt that this is a credible and potentially capable class contender, rather than a family hatch on growth hormones. That chromed upper profile strip continues around the lower part of the glasswork. The slim tail lamps feature full LED technology and upper spec models get a silvered lower skid plate style section beneath the bumper. Of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. In this case, the lengthened version of the small wide architecture Fiat Chrysler Group platform, also used in the Renegade and in that model's close cousin, the Fiat 500X. It's a notably stiff structure, more than 65% of which is fashioned from high strength steel. Let's take a seat inside. Again, the aggressively stylized touches of the Renegade are missing here. The cabin instead favoring a more mature, downscaled Grand Cherokee demeanor that Jeep thinks is more appropriate to the segment. The chunky three-spoke wheel feels great to hold, the driving position's properly commanding, and the rubber floor mats and the chunky design of the various controls remind you that you're in a car from a brand that only makes SUVs. Even the fascia's dominant feature, this Uconnect touchscreen, has been developed with a nod to SUV motoring. Get yourself a model where the base 5-inch monitor has been upgraded to this 8.4-inch display and once you've downloaded an appropriate app, you'll be able to use a Jeep Skills feature that measures drive, pitch, roll, pressure and altitude to give you real-time feedback on your off-road driving abilities. You'll also get information on things like G-forces, steering angle and performance uh, guidance to recommended routes and online awards called badges to recognize improvements in your driving prowess. Or perhaps more interest to most buyers will be the more ordinary things this improved display can offer. In addition to the usual vehicle information, audio and navigational readouts, there are climate and ventilation options too, though thankfully proper buttons for these also feature beneath the monitor. As on other Fiat Chrysler models, the screen setup is admirably clear and intuitive to use, with voice activation and control systems that are easy to figure out so you won't have to be delving into the manual every time you want to Bluetooth pair your phone or try to find a point of interest on the sat-nav. There's voice control, as I said, there's also pinch and swipe functionality for the colour screen and a text-to-talk feature if you need it. Avoid entry-level trim and there's an Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring feature too. 
For best use of this infotainment setup, you'll want to download the compatible Uconnect Live app onto your smartphone that will allow you to customise your onboard entertainment, accessing internet radio, online music and social media. Plus, you'll receive updates on your vehicle status and have all information relating to your journey brought to you in real time. Anything this screen can't tell you, and duplications of much that it can, will be covered off by the further driver information display provided between the recessed dials and the instrument binnacle, which appropriately permanently displays compass coordinates. Uh, this is 3.5 inches in size on mainstream models, but top variants like this one get a larger 7-inch monitor that offers a wide range of viewing customization via steering wheel buttons. Uh, everything from a digital speed readout to tyre pressures, safety warnings, a real-time economy meter, a trip computer, audio settings and navigation. What else? Uh, well, the way that everything's been screwed together by the Indian factory seems okay. But despite the piano black centre stack trimming and the orange seat and door card stitching of this upscale model, there isn't much in terms of cabin design or material quality that would reference premium brand quality. Take this rather plasticky feeling gear uh, knob for example. All of this might be a slight issue for customers paying the sort of money Jeep wants for a really plush variant like this one. Uh, we've also mixed thoughts about the ergonomics. We like the way that most of the controls are large enough to be operated with a gloved hand, uh, plenty of seat and wheel adjustment makes it easy for drivers of all shapes and sizes to quickly get comfortable. Plus the high set seating position referenced earlier means great forward visibility. Thanks to the stylized rear C-pillar though, your rear three-quarter view isn't so great. Hence the need for a standard rear view camera beyond entry level trim. Ideally, it would also have improved the layout of the switchgear at the bottom of the center stack, much of which isn't especially intuitive to reach down and operate without taking your eyes off the road. As for cabin practicality, well, you get door bins that are bigger than they look, a glove box big enough to swallow a tablet, and USB aux in and 12 volt input points rather over prominently displayed at the bottom of the centre stack. It'd be good if there was also a USB or a 12 volt port in this deep lidded box uh, between the seats so that you could charge your handset away from prying eyes. Just in front of this are twin cup holders plus there's a cubby for coins in front of the gear stick. There's no overhead compartment for your sunglasses but you do get this little netted compartment in the front passenger footwell. Time to move back to the rear. Now the Compass is 150 millimeters longer than Jeep's smaller Renegade model and much of that extra length has gone into improving the size of the rear passenger compartment enough to make it a slightly larger thing than obvious segment class leaders. This car is 26 millimeters longer than a Qashqai and 57 millimeters longer than an Attica which is a difference that ought to be obvious once you get inside. And is. It's difficult to imagine how the company's smaller Renegade model could be suitable for family use, but the addition here of an extra seven centimeters between the front and the rear wheels makes all the difference. Mid-sized SUVs certainly aren't all the same when it comes to this issue. Pricier ones like Volkswagen's Tiguan and Honda's CRV offering you much more rear seat space than cheaper Qashqai's and Attica's. Now it wouldn't be too much of an exaggeration to say that this Compass gives you the space without the price premium that you might ordinarily expect to have to find for it. Um, certainly paying quite a lot more for Jeep's supposedly more upmarket Cherokee model wouldn't give you really any more usable head and leg room than this. Don't get me wrong, there are issues. The cabin isn't really any wider than obvious rivals, so it's still going to be a bit of a squash with three fully sized adults back here. Though, if that's really necessary, the relatively low height of this centre transmission tunnel will help. Small door pockets, uh, twin vents and seatback pockets are all provided. You even get a USB port and a 230 volt 3 pin plug socket. Plus if you're able to stretch to a top limited variant like this one, the centre part of the bench can be folded forward to reveal a couple of cup holders. 
the decent headroom that I just referred to will be somewhat compromised if you've a car fitted with this big command view panoramic sunroof, though this feature does help to alleviate the otherwise slightly claustrophobic feel delivered by these kicked up side windows. And out back, well, we'd expected that the extended rear overhang would deliver one of the bigger boots in the class. In fact, there's 438 litres of space here, about the same as you'd have in a Qashqai. This is, of course, a big improvement on the 351 litre capacity of a Renegade, but is well behind what you get in, say, class favourites like that Volkswagen Tiguan I mentioned or Peugeot's 3008. We appreciate the three level adjustable height boot floor, but it's quite a lip over which you've to hump heavier items and the wheel arches do intrude a little into the space available. A 12 volt socket's provided as well as the usual bag hooks and tie down points. We're surprised though that a proper SUV maker like Jeep feels the need to charge extra for the spare wheel that sits beneath the boot floor and uses nearly all the space there. Only the top Trailhawk variant gets this as standard. When you do have a spare wheel fitted, it's almost impossible to properly use the adjustable height boot floor. On this top limited model, the rear bench is usefully segmented with a 40-20-40 split so that if necessary, you can accommodate longer objects like skis without disturbing a couple of rear seated folk. But if that's not enough and you need to push forward the backrest, a decent amount of extra space can be freed up. Now, unfortunately, unlike in that smaller Jeep model, there's no option for the kind of fold flat front passenger seat that would enable you to take really long items. Still, up to 1,251 litres of space should be sufficient for the needs of most family folk, though rather curiously, that's 46 litres less than you get in a Renegade. Compass pricing starts at around £23,000, but that only gets you an entry-level base-spec diesel front-driven sport variant that few will want. It's more realistic to think in terms of a £25,000 to £30,000 budget assigned to one of the mid-range, longitude or limited models. We've got a limited variant here. That'll give you most of the choice you'll need, but bear in mind that your spend will have to be close to the higher end of that bracket if you want the four-wheel drive system that the American brand expects most buyers to prefer. You could spend much more than that on a Compass. Uh, top versions can cost uh, up towards £35,000, and from launch the company required close to £36,000 for the rare flagship Trailhawk model that Jeep provides for committed off-road enthusiasts. We should talk about engines. For petrol people, there are a couple of 1.4 litre multi-air two power plants, a 140 horsepower unit only available in front driven manual form and a 170 horsepower variant only offered in 4x4 auto guys. Most though will want one of the Multijet 2 diesels. As with the petrol range, the starting point, which with black pump fuel models is a 1.6 litre 120 horsepower unit, limits you to front wheel drive and manual transmission. So you might want to progress to the 2 litre 140 horsepower engine that we're trying here, solely available as part of a manual gearbox four wheel drive package. This engine is also available in an uprated 170 horsepower state of tune, again with four wheel drive, but in that case packaged up with automatic transmission. That same 2 litre Multijet 2 170 horsepower unit is the one featuring with the top Trailhawk trim we mentioned earlier. What else might you need to know? Well, on a mainstream four-wheel drive compass model like this one, you get Jeep's active drive setup, mated to the brand's select terrain driving mode system. That top Trailhawk model features a further developed active drive low package, which has a low range gearbox added in, along with hill descent control. There's nothing on the market that's really directly comparable to a Compass Trailhawk, but of course there are plenty of volume brand alternatives that compete against more mainstream models like this one. Now, before we get into discussing those, it's worth putting the pricing of this car into context from an overall Jeep range perspective. An equivalent version of the company's smaller Renegade model costs around £4,000 less. An equivalent version of the similarly sized Cherokee costs around £5,000 more. 
Jeep, though, hope that the Compass will appeal to large numbers of Conquest customers who've never considered the brand before. Is that likely? Quite possibly. The only other brand in this sector with a four-wheel drive heritage similar to Jeep's is Subaru, but that Japanese maker's entrant in this class, the XV, can't be had in diesel form, so its segment impact is somewhat limited. Interestingly, in equivalent petrol auto guise, an XV is very comparably priced against a similarly specified compass. But what about the really big hitters in the class this car must compete in? If you're considering these, then at first glance, compass pricing might look a little optimistic. The sticker figures for SUVs in the mid-sized volume brand segment do, after all, start at just under £20,000. But that, of course, only gets you front-wheel drive, a relatively feeble engine, and a pretty spartan level of spec. Someone serious about buying a contender like this Jeep is likely to want more, and if that's the case, the picture changes considerably. To get, say, a say a Attica or a Nissan Qashqai diesel with the kind of pulling power that an entry-level Compass Sport 1.6 multi-jet diesel model could provide for £23,000, you're looking at needing to spend £26 to £27,000, which kind of puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Don't misunderstand us. Uh, in overall terms, against most rivals in this class, there will often be a premium to pay for this Jeep's heritage and extra capability. But then, to some extent, you'd expect that. It makes sense to mainly base our price comparison comments around the mid-range 2-litre multi-jet 140-horsepower 4x4 diesel variant that we're testing here, since this will be one of the most popular variants in the range. Pitched from just under £29,000, a Compass in this form will cost you about the same as 4x4 diesel versions of the Nissan Qashqai, the Honda CRV, and the Volkswagen Tiguan, but around £2,500 to £3,000 more than equivalent versions of segment favourites like Seat's Attica, the Renault Kajar, the Skoda Karok, the Kia Sportage, or the Mini Countryman. Comparable versions of the Ford Cougar and the Mazda CX-5 would save you about a thousand pounds. There's no directly comparable version of the high end Tucson and you can't have four-wheel drive at all in a Peugeot 3008 or a Vauxhall Grandland X. Top Compass variants priced in the 30,000 to 35,000 pound bracket start to stray into premium brand territory in this sector, inviting comparisons with posher badged C-segment SUVs like the Mercedes GLA, the BMW X1, the Audi Q3 and the Volvo XC40. Equip an equivalently powerful version of any of these cars to the levels you get in this Jeep though and you can expect to have to pay thousands more. If, having considered all of that, you conclude that there really is nothing quite like a compass in this class, you're going to need to know just how generous the American brand has been with the standard spec. Time for the detail on that. Even the entry-level sport model comes with 16-inch alloy wheels, daytime running lights, auto headlights, uh, LED tail lamps, uh, electric mirrors, all-round power windows and an alarm. Inside you get air conditioning, a six-way adjustable driver's seat, cruise control, Bluetooth phone connectivity and a multifunction leather steering wheel via which you can control a decent quality four-speaker DAB stereo. That's also accessible via the standard five-inch Uconnect touchscreen, the portal through which you can activate a whole range of infotainment services. Download the Uconnect Live app onto your smartphone and you'll be able to access internet radio, online music and Reuters news at the same time as keeping yourself connected through Facebook and Twitter. If you've decided on a compass but want to treat yourself to something a bit nicer than sport level trim, then you'll want to look at paying from £25,000 upwards for one of the mid-range longitude models. Here you get larger 17-inch wheels, front fog lights, uh, roof rails, a rear parking camera, keyless entry and power folding mirrors. Inside at this level there's dual zone climate control, ambient lighting, front seat lumbar adjustment, an auto dimming rear view mirror and upholstery trimmed in a mixture of fabric and faux leather you'll need to stretch at least to longitude level to get the upgraded Uconnect infotainment system that most Compass customers want with the larger 8.4 inch screen, satellite navigation and access to the special Jeep Skills driving app. 
The next step up in the range is the plush limited spec we've got here. A range of little exterior details set this trim level apart. Things like LED signature lighting around the halogen projector headlamps, deeply tinted sunscreen glass, roof rails with a chrome insert and a chrome tipped exhaust. You also get rain sensitive wipers, all round parking sensors, exterior mirror courtesy lamps and windscreen wiper de-icers. And inside, well, in the Jeep range, limited spec is always guaranteed full leather upholstery, and so it is here, the front seats being also heated and eight-way power adjustable. The instrument binnacle gets a larger seven-inch customizable TFT screen. There's an upgraded Beats audio system, plus limited spec gives you a heated steering wheel, all-weather floor mats, a center split section for the rear bench, and an extra package of safety features that I'll cover in a minute. That only leaves the rare flagship Trailhawk model at the top of the range. The spec here is mainly based around limited trim, but the main reason you'd want this variant would be to get its enhanced off-road ability, courtesy of a Jeep Active Drive low four-wheel drive system with a low-range gearbox, something virtually unheard of in this segment. In really gnarly terrain, this, along with a raised off-road suspension package, will allow you to really crawl along. And with that in mind, Jeep has, for this derivative, extended the Select Terrain Driving Mode system to include an extra rock setting. Plus, you get underbody skid plates, special off-road orientated 17-inch alloy wheels, uh, heel descent control, and a full-size spare wheel. When it comes to the options list, bear in mind that it's not really possible to buy an entry-level sport model, then add in the extra cost things you want. Uh, most optional features require you to have progressed at least to mid-range longitude trim. Uh, we certainly think you'd need a spare wheel on a car of this kind. And while box ticking, we'd also want to look at the electric sliding command view panoramic glass roof. Uh, you might additionally want to consider the powered rear tailgate, uh, which Jeep insists on calling a lift gate. Go for the limited trim level that we've got here, and there's a much wider range of options. An optional premium pack includes the aforementioned powered lift gate, along with adaptive cruise control, which on the highway can constantly regulate your distance to the vehicle in front, slowing you down and even automatically stopping and starting you off again if you come across a tailback. On a limited spec compass model, you can also add in a visibility pack, which gives you piercing HID headlamps with an auto high beam feature. There's also a style pack, which gives you larger 19 inch wheels shod with special three season tires. And you can add in cooled ventilation for the front seats if you want to. But maybe if your budget's not especially restricted, you'll avoid all this box ticking and simply go for the limited plus pack, which gives you almost everything you could want in one hit. The visibility pack, the style pack, the ventilated front seats, and the command view panoramic glass roof. Job done. What else? Well, you're almost certainly going to be paying extra for paintwork. A pastel Mojave sand finish is the only one that comes at no extra cost. Beyond that, there's a bright Colorado red option, a range of different metallic shades, and the pearlescent vocal white finish that we have here. Go for a limited or a trail halt variant, and with most of the colors, you'll get the rather expensive option to add in a contrasting color gloss black roof, suiting the current segment trend. As for practical touches, well, uh, many Compass owners are going to want to add in the towing pack that we've got on this particular car, which includes a gooseneck towing hitch and a 13-pin wiring harness. On the mid-range longitude model, a winter pack gives you heat for the front seats and steering wheel, uh, windscreen wiper de-icers and all-weather floor mats. Want to go further? If so, you can customize the look of your Compass to your heart's content, thanks to Jeep's Mopar accessory range, which offers things like mirror covers and front grills in different shades, plus a series of different stickers for the bonnet and the body sides. There are door sill covers, uh, black rock rail guards for the lower side sills, and side window air deflectors. For the boot, you can order a rubber molded cargo tray, a premium carpet cargo mat, 
a cargo net, a cargo bay organizer with telescopic arms, floor rails to which you can attach an elasticated strap, and a special cargo tote bag. And as you'd expect from a modern lifestyle orientated car, there's a wide selection of roof boxes and tow bar mounted systems designed for transporting winter and water sports equipment such as bikes, surfboards, skis and snowboards. On to safety. This generation Compass certainly had to raise the bar here. Its predecessor received a miserable two star rating from the experts at Euro NCAP and that was with the older, less stringent test being used back then. It's very different this time round. Uh, Jeep referencing a range of over 70 available active and passive safety and security features. As a result, this present generation design received a full house five star rating from Euro NCAP with adult protection rated at 90% and child protection at 83%. This impressive showing came thanks primarily to a couple of things. First, the much stronger body. This Compass boasts a safety cage construction with more than 65% high strength steel. And second, the standard provision across the range of autonomous braking as standard. Jeep calls its system Forward Collision Warning Plus. As usual with these kinds of setups, this one scans the road ahead as you, as you drive for potential accident hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, then the car will automatically brake itself, decreasing the severity of any resulting accident. Lane departure warning also comes included to warn you if you drift over lane delineating lines on the highway. All models also get the expected things, Isofix child seat fastenings, tyre pressure monitoring, uh, an energy absorbing steering column, hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions, and twin front, side and curtain airbags. To try and make sure those bags won't be needed, there's plenty of electronic assistance. ESC stability control and electronic roll mitigation, of course, plus all speed traction control and a brake traction control system to offer extra grip on start off or through the bends. The ABS braking system features panic brake assist and ready alert braking to quicken emergency stops. There's a DST driving steering torque system to counter scary oversteer on low grip surfaces and trailer sway control will come in useful too if you'll be fitting a tow bar and doing some towing. If you want more, you'll need to stretch to a limited or a Trailhawk spec model. If you're able to do that, then you'll get two further camera driven features. A blind spot monitoring system warns you if you're about to dangerously pull out to overtake another car. And a rear cross path detection system will alert you to oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a parking bay. Jeep's put a great deal of development into this generation Compass model, but one of the things the brand hasn't been able to optimize to any great extent is the engine wear that sits beneath the bonnet. This car was launched with pretty much the same multi-air petrol and multi-jet diesel power plants that the Fiat Chrysler conglomerate has been fitting to various models since back in 2009. And of course, engine technology has moved on considerably since then. Given that, and Jeep's traditional emphasis on solid build and heavy four-wheel drive systems, we weren't expecting a top-class showing from this car in terms of overall running cost efficiency. Actually though, it doesn't do too badly, returning a set of running cost returns that should reassure buyers new to the brand. Helping here is the way that this car has been based on the platform and running gear of a much smaller FCA group model, the Fiat 500X. Given that this Compass is a larger class of SUV and about 110 kilograms heavier than its Italian cousin, it's quite impressive that it gets to within 7 to 8% of that car's efficiency showing, depending on the variant that you're looking at. Take the entry level version of this car, the 1.6 litre Multijet 120 diesel derivative, which comes only in front driven form. This manages 64.2 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 117 grams per kilometre of CO2. Even this four wheel drive 2 litre Multijet diesel model manages 54.3 miles to the gallon and 138 grams per kilometre. 
go for the 2 litre multi jet engine in 170 horsepower form though, in which case you have to have automatic transmission and your returns will take a bit of a hit, falling to 49.6 miles to the gallon and 148 grams per kilometre. The Go Anywhere Trail Halt version also uses that 2 litre multi jet 170 horsepower diesel to record the same fuel consumption figure, but thanks to this derivative's more capable active drive low four wheel drive package, the CO2 figure for this variant falls to 158 grams per kilometre. Switch your attention to petrol power and you'll find that the front driven 140 horsepower 1.4 litre multi air model can manage 45.6 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 143 grams per kilometre of CO2. Go for that multi air engine in top 170 horsepower guys where it's mated with four wheel drive and a heavier 9 speed auto box and you're looking at 40.9 miles to the gallon and 160 grams per kilometre. You'll need some perspective here and we'll try and give it to you. The figures for the petrol models are some way off the class standard, as you might expect given the multi-air engine's age. The figures of the multi-jet diesel units though do much better. If you take this 2 litre 140 horsepower four-wheel drive compass variant as an example, its figures are only a few percentage points away from what you get in a comparable Seat Attica 2 litre TDI 4x4 or a Nissan Qashqai 1.6 litre DCI 130 horsepower 4x4, which, given this Jeep's extra capability, isn't a bad showing at all. So, how has Jeep done it? The brand points to things like optimised aerodynamics, electric power steering and detailed touches like the lightweight aluminium wheels. Engine efficiency is aided by a very efficient exhaust gas recirculation system and a particularly effective close coupled diesel particulate filter. Plus of course there's the usual stop start system which cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. The 4x4 versions are aided by features like the rear axle disconnect system which seamlessly switches into two-wheel drive when 4x4 traction isn't needed. Of course, the ultimate figures you achieve will depend very much on how you drive, something you can monitor here in various ways. There's a fuel economy meter in the instrument binnacle screen and the infotainment systems you connect live section has an eco drive screen which monitors your driving in real time via four parameters acceleration deceleration shifting gears and speed variation what else might you need to know well there's a very good five year 70,000 mile warranty with three years of servicing and five years of breakdown cover included in the deal uh, we'd want to opt for the Mopar Vehicle Protection Freedom Pack, which extends the warranty to five years and provides competitively priced servicing and assistance plans. The petrol models need servicing every year or every 9,000 miles, whichever occurs sooner. Uh, for the diesel variants, it's every year or every 12,500 miles. As for residual values, well, industry experts CAP HPI reckon that after the standard three year 60,000 mile period, a compass variant like this 2 litre multi jet 4x4 model I'm driving here would still be worth 42% of its original purchase price, a reasonable showing by class standards. On to insurance groups. In the petrol range, you're looking at Group 19E for the 1.4 litre multi air 140 horsepower variant. The pricey 1.4 litre multi air 170 horsepower automatic four wheel drive derivative is Group 21E. In the diesel range, the base 1.6 litre multi jet 120 front driven model is rated at either Group 16E or 17E, while this 2 litre multi jet 140 horsepower four wheel drive variant is pitched at Group 18E or 20E, depending on the variant. The 2 litre multi jet 170 horsepower four wheel drive auto variant is Group 21E. And the top four wheel drive automatic trail hop model with the same 170 horsepower 2 litre multi jet diesel is rated at Group 22E. You get the impression that customers in the mid sized SUV market want Jeep to succeed. They may not have bought its cars in the recent past, 
but they'd like to have been able to credibly consider them. Now they can once more. This compass may not be the most sophisticated, affordable model of its kind that you can buy, but unlike its predecessors, it's now a tough and tempting way to buy into this macho mark. The magazines will tell you that there are better cars in this segment, but none of the contenders concerned feel as much of an authentic SUV as this Compass does. To get this, you've to make a few small compromises in terms of ride refinement and tarmac drive dynamics. And whether you're prepared to do that will depend on the kind of buyer you are. If all you really want is a jacked up family hatch, go ahead and buy a Qashqai or an Attica. They're very good cars, but arguably they're not very good SUVs. It all comes down to whether you think the difference is important. What's at stake then is the definition of what a car of this kind should be. Jeep reckons that the design of a model in this segment should be more than just about plastic skid plates and raised suspension. It always has. The difference here though is that the company has at last made a car that credibly represents that philosophy in the affordable mid-size section of the mainstream market. In future, the company will build better SUVs than this, but there's no doubt that what's on offer here represents a big step forward for the brand. When testing this smaller Renegade, we pointed out that if you eat squirrel, own a bowling ball, or call your first cousin your spouse, then that model probably wouldn't be your cup of tea. And the same, of course, applies here. The Compass won't satisfy the purest perception of what a real Jeep should be, but it's the people's idea of one. A car you purchase, picturing yourself at a beach barbecue, tailgate open, its speakers blasting the blues towards the crashing waves. If it cost premium money, you'd still maybe think twice, but it doesn't. Competing instead with mainstream brand rivals that often still lack credibility in this sector. Credibility, of course, is something that the Jeep name has never lacked. Good to see it then, with products now more worthy of that famous batch.